Good evening and welcome. You're with News 24's Editor's Table. I'm Sheldon Morias, Associate Editor for Fast News, and thank you for joining us as we discuss this week's big issue, which has to be the vaccine rollout program uh, that we currently see being rolled out across the country. Uh, this week's issue is a burning one, one that has gripped the nation's attention um, and, and has, has moved the focus of, of the, the COVID-19 story in South Africa. How has the vaccine program been roll, rolling out? What's been happening on the ground? How have people been experiencing it? So this week's edition of uh, Editor's Table will be discussing that. And joined, joining me today um, are uh, News24 senior journalists, Teboho Monama and Kavil Singh, who've been working on the ground covering COVID-19, the vaccine, uh, the third wave, which has, uh, you know, which has officially arrived in, in at least three of our provinces um, in the country, as well as Business Insiders Associate Editor Philip DeVet, who's been doing amazing work uh, on the numbers surrounding the, 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 the vaccine rollout how it's been rolling out as well, because this is a, it's a rollout that's been, that's been underpinned by a data system, which has and hasn't worked in, in, in some instances, and hasn't been working in the way government has intended. And then someone who's been on top of the COVID-19 story ever since it broke, helping us all understand the science and the health aspect of it, because it really has been a, a really, you know, a science and a health story uh, uh, has COVID-19 ever since it, you know, uh, broke, is Mia Milan, the editor of the Becky Sisa Center of Health Journalism. Mia, thank you and welcome to, to uh, News24 and joining us this evening. Okay, there we, if we just get, uh, oh, there we go, yeah. Um, we, we, we should, it would have been a lot better and a lot easier if we were around a, a table, but we've got to be responsible journalists and we've got to do this uh, virtually as well. Um, so thanks very much. Thank you to Kavil. Thank you to Philip. Thank you to Tebojo. Uh, and again, thank you to Mia as well. There's a lot for us to cover and I know an, an hour is going to fly by. But just a few housekeeping rules. Thank you to our subscribers who are joining us in the webinar um, as well, as well as those viewers joining us via YouTube. Um, if you're a subscriber and you're joining us via the webinar, you can add your questions, your comments um, to the Q&A function on the, on the um, webinar functions there. Uh, you can join that. And if you're joining us via YouTube and would like to add your comment next time, the editor's table is a, is a regular feature on News24. You can simply subscribe to News24 and you'll be the first to know when we have it, what the topic is and how you can join in as well. And we can have, uh, you know, do our best to answer your questions. Mia, let me start with you. We've heard a lot. I mean, you know, as I said, COVID-19 really has been uh, the, the, the story that has pushed science and health journalism to the forefront. And a lot of us as journalists have had to come to grips with the specifics because the specifics matter. You know, a lot of us know that, you know, vaccines, we were either vaccinated as children or we go for the flu vaccine once a year. But why is a vaccine important when it comes to COVID-19? Okay, so that's a great question. So in easy language, a vaccine is something that prepares your body to protect itself quickly against the germs such as a virus. And in the case of COVID-19, vaccines help our bodies to protect us against a virus called SARS-CoV-2. And how vaccines do this is to inject either a code into your body that tells it how to respond. So that is in the case of mRNA vaccines such as Pfizer and Moderna, or to inject a harmless virus with aspects of SARS-CoV-2 into your body that makes it think it's the virus and then learn how to produce antibodies against it. And then your body remembers to how to produce those antibodies and when you get infected with a real virus you can respond very quickly um, to protect yourself against the virus but important to remember that vaccines don't necessarily mean it doesn't mean that they protect you from getting infected there are very very almost no vaccines in the world do that what they do is they protect your body from falling ill so developing the disease that the virus causes and Everyone in the country is talking about herd immunity, but it's really important to understand that if 
a COVID vaccine doesn't reduce someone who's been vaccinated, that person's ability to transmit the virus to someone else, then we're not going to reach herd immunity. We're just going to have a vaccine that makes people not fall ill. So we're not going to have hospitals filled with people. At the moment, we know very little about the um, reduction in transmissibility of vaccinated people. There is some promising data that shows that in the case of Pfizer, for instance, it's very initial data that it does reduce your um, ability to transmit the virus somewhat, but we don't have a lot of data on that yet. And that's sort of what all the scientists are waiting for, to see if there is some transmissibility. If we don't have vaccines in the country or in the world, what it means is in the case of COVID, we know that at least 10% of people fall very ill. So we're gonna have hospitals full of ill people and we're gonna have people who die all the time. So if we vaccinate enough people, even if we don't know about the reduction in transmissibility yet, we at least know that we're going to have fewer people from di dying and we're going to have hospital beds for other diseases where people fall ill. All the beds wouldn't be filled up by COVID. Now, yes, to stay with you and, and the nature of vaccines, we saw, I mean, un unprecedented uh, scientific innovation in, in, the, in how quickly these vaccines came to market compared to, you know, vaccines previously as well. Um, they've, you know, for years they've been, you know, um, talk around vaccines and safety, you know, even some people, you know, when it comes to the flu vaccine are, are hesitant. Um, what, is, what are the levels of safety when it comes to a vaccine that has been, or vaccines specifically uh, for COVID-19 that have come to market, you know, and, and being used on a mass scale as quickly as it has? So it's important to know, I think what many people don't know is that there are other coronaviruses that people have been working on for a decade to develop vaccines for. And those two coronaviruses, except for the normal cold viruses that are also often caused by coronaviruses, the two main ones that they've been working on, you may recall the SARS pandemic, and that's why this virus is also called SARS-CoV-2. It's just that the previous one was CoV-1. And the MERS epidemic, in the um, Middle East. So a lot of the years that you would normally work on developing a vaccine had already been done before this virus emerged because they similar viruses. So a lot of the stuff that was done on, on SARS and on MERS was transferred to this. Also, interestingly enough, a lot of the work that has been done on the HIV vaccine has been taken to be used with the vaccines here. And the other thing that made it happen so quickly is there has been an extraordinary amount of collaboration among scientists, something that we've never seen before. For instance, when the virus emerged, you know, scientists can be pretty jealous of each other and not sharing data so widely. It was one of the first times that we saw um, scientists share the genetic code of a virus. If you didn't have that code, you couldn't develop a vaccine. And they shared it like instantly. So that helped. And the other thing is we've had lots and lots of money. If you come, just to give you an idea, the amount of money that the US government has invested in developing COVID vaccines is um, 50 times more than what they've spent on developing an HIV vaccine. That's been 20 years of work, right? So within a year, they spent more money than that. And when all these things came together, we were able to develop vaccines relatively quickly. And it's also going to help us to, in the future, develop vaccines more quickly, given that we also have so much money and also so much collaboration, and bearing in mind that we wouldn't necessarily, for any new disease, have the work um, that had already been done on coronavirus vaccines that we, we could work with and take further. Now, we've, we've got the vaccine. It's, you know, many countries are, are, are vaccinating tens of thousands of people uh, on a daily basis. Mia, as you mentioned, you know, they're, they're, you know the, the money spent on this, the collaboration has been unprecedented as well. But the focus of what we, what we are trying to understand today is how the how government's uh, plan has rolled out. Philip, I'm not going to look to you and, and take us back to when government first started the procurement process. Uh, I think, you know, initially there was concerns and complaints 
uh, and criticisms of government's action did it kick in too late? Um, you've been looking at, at the numbers, the procurements, the costs as well. Let's start with government's efforts. I mean, did they, did they start early enough to try and get vaccines for, for citizens? No, no, uh, by, by no stretch of the imagination. We've had many debates since about rich countries hoarding vaccines and, you know, how it's the fault of people who are hoarding the intellectual property and so on and so forth. The fact of the matter is South Africa started late. South Africa did poorly. South Africa negotiated poorly. Uh, we have a new report this week which shows that uh, when we bought the AstraZeneca of, uh, vaccines, which we finally abandoned, we overpaid by about 25 percent by, by any objective measure. We only got those because we begged and pleaded and threw what political weight we have around because we came very late to the game. It does appear that vaccines simply weren't a priority and like many of the administrative steps along the way, we botched things. Uh, you may recall that uh, there was a big brouhaha because we weren't paying our COVAX uh, contribution early enough. This was going to secure a, a set of vaccines for us. Then we had to scramble to find the money and there was a question about where the money was going to come from. And now, in the end, we paid that COVAX contribution. We still didn't get any vaccines because things went to hell. In the meanwhile, we tossed out AstraZeneca because it doesn't seem to work against the variants in South Africa. Uh, things went to hell in India, so production uh, there of AstraZeneca became a problem and so on and so forth. So it's it's because there's so much going on, it's very hard to say, well, it's government's fault for doing X, Y, and Z. We would probably have been in this boat anyway. We would probably have had too few vaccines, as do most places in the world. But did we do a good job where we could, and did we do what we could? Absolutely not. Uh, we we failed on multiple fronts there. Now, Philip, you know now we've got the vaccines. We've seen I see the the the, the latest numbers show that over seven hundred thousand uh, people have been vaccinated. That's not to be scoffed at. Do we have the vaccines? Uh, that we need to reach government's targets? That is the question. Will the vaccines keep flowing? So we should soon see uh, about 600,000 doses of Pfizer come in every week. That will make a, a, a significant difference, and, and that's great to have in the mix. But the big question is, what is happening with those J&J &J vaccines? Um, we're effectively waiting for the FDA in the US to unblock those. You'll recall that there were concerns about blood clotting and then cross-contamination. So that's why those were blocked. And we found ourselves kind of at the mercy of the American regulators there for reasons both good and bad. Now, what we've been hearing out of that is as of last week, we heard that it was imminent that the release would be um, allowed any second that's seven days ago, you know, that's a, that's a long time in, in terms of the timeframes that we're working on now. And those are particularly important because they're in South Africa. It's not a transport issue. They are allocated to us. Uh, there's, there's, there's no kind of issue of someone else who can stop them from being exported from the European Union or whatever the case may be. They don't require ultra cold storage, which is slightly better in terms of our logistics. And they're a single dose. Uh, they're a single shot. You know, so suddenly you have people who you put it in their arms today and two weeks from today, they are considered fully, fully vaccinated. Um, that's a huge step forward. So again, it, it's partially out of our hands um, and partially there's, there's nothing that we can do about about it um, and we're kind of waiting for this thing to play out and for better days to come yeah you've got you've got a comment to add to this yeah i just want to add to the j and j vaccines it's not partially out of our control it's 100 percent out of our control government does a lot of things wrong but this is not something we can hold them responsible for the reason why the pause has been implemented has nothing to do with blood clots it has to do that you know that previous pause was about blood clots the the current not rolling out of it has to do with the fact that there was a factory in the US where some the, the, in, the main ingredient that you used to make the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was contaminated. They, in that factory, they made both AstraZeneca vaccines and they made Johnson & Johnson vaccines. And when the FDA went for an inspection, they saw some of the rules that were broken. And the reason why it's paused, it's not just us, it's around the world, not a single j and 
vaccine can release, be released at the moment. And it's because they're busy with a safety um, investigation. They a bit, they're not very communicative, the FDA at the moment. They're a bit, you know, cagey with the information. It seems like our batch in South Africa was not affected, but there's really nothing that the health department can do until there's a go ahead for this to continue. And with regards to COVAX, you know, COVAX works on prepayments, and if the vaccines are not there, there's not much you can do. Now, the interesting thing about us starting late with our, you know, procurement for vaccines is that scientifically it didn't work so much against us. Because if, can you imagine if we had bought millions and millions of AstraZeneca vaccines early? That's what we would have done, right? Because that is the vaccine that COVAX would have given us. So because it happened a bit later, the Johnson & Johnson trial um, happened and also the later AstraZeneca trial happened at a stage when we already had a new variant in South Africa. That it was by coincidence that we could get that data that tells us whether it works or not. It wasn't planned really. And because of that, we now have two vaccines that work relatively well at this stage against the variant that we identified here. And the interesting thing about us going to buy um, AstraZeneca vaccines from India is essentially we bought up COVAX stock. That stock that we bought was meant for COVAX. Um, the reason we didn't start so early, and I mean, I don't think it was necessarily good that we didn't start early, was because we waited to, we wanted to have solidarity and wait to see um, what, invest our money in COVAX, which is not necessarily a good idea to just all invest it into one thing. But in the end, we went against that principle. We went to go and buy the stock from the institution that we try to support um, to have solidarity. So just scientifically, um, if we had bought vaccines very early, I think we could very well have ended up with vaccines in the country that didn't work against our variant. But that I'm not trying to justify late action. I'm just trying to say one of the unintended, unintended consequences was that we, do, we are now in a position where we've bought two vaccines that show that looks like it's going to work that looks like it's going to work and i think that's 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 important Tebojo, you've had a look at you know you and Kavil have been covering the rolling news on the grounds the likes of of um uh, experts on the mac uh, committees um, as well as on the ground at at um at, at vaccination sites as well how does it look like from the ground you know in terms of the rollout of the vaccine program um, thank you so much, Sheldon. Um, I think last week it was a bit of a tough start. You know, it was like um, stop and start, you know, at, at vaccination sites because they opened with only a few vaccination sites. And you could see that old people wanted to be vaccinated. Already on the first day, uh, I was in the west end of Johannesburg and there were queues already. Lots of people there wanted to be vaccinated. Um, I think the issues that you're seeing at vaccination sites are mostly around the registrations. Right, the EVDS system. People are saying we're registering, but we are not getting SMSs. We're not told when to come to the vaccination sites, or they don't know where their vac vaccination sites are. Uh, and when you go to the vaccination sites, the nurses are very helpful. The queues are very long, but the people are being registered at the site. I think this is one of the things that might be a problem in the long term when we have uh, more vaccines. But for now, it's still working out nicely because uh, we don't have we're not uh, vaccinating a lot of people uh, right now. But I think in the long term, when maybe next month when we have more vaccines, it's going to be a bit of a problem because we're, we're going to, if the EVDS system does not work, we're going to have even longer queues at vaccination sites. So I think that's one thing that the department needs to work on. Um, I'll come to you, Kavil, but I'd like to touch uh, on, on Philip as well, bringing in the EVDS system. You've, you and your team have spent a lot of time uh, over the last week or two, having having a look at that system. Now, anecdotally, what we're hearing is people who are registered um, over the age of 60, because that's where we are in, 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 in phase two. Uh, we're currently running phase 1B and phase two. Um, 
and in phase two, it's obviously if you're 60 years or older, you you know you 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 qualify to to um, get the vaccine if you followed certain certain procedures, registering on the on the EVDS site, uh, getting your second second SMS confirming your appointment, and going to uh, the vaccination site uh, identified. But what we found is that people are who have registered rightfully, so they're in the system, but haven't got the SMSs yet. Um, and the like, they're arriving at, 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 at vaccine sites and, and are being vaccinated. Is, is, is that an indication that we don't need an EV uh, a system like the EVDS1? Uh, is, is it, you know, should we rather just be focusing on, on, on getting as many people vaccinated with a rather looser system? Um, what have you found in terms of the actual working of the system having spoken to, to the health department and those responsible for it? Look, I have to tell you, we, we speak to the health department and kind of stop, start fashion and our information is, is very fragmentary. Um, and, and that's part of the larger problem. There's the system, the EVDS system, but then there's the broader rollout and the broader communication around it. Let me give an example. Since the 18th of May, that's now a, a good little while ago, we've been pushing the Department of Health. Um, we came across an instance where people in a rural vaccine center couldn't fill in their forms um, because the forms and the consent forms that they were given were so badly photocopied that they were completely illegible. Um, and, and the health department said they were going to sort it out and, and that's a big thing. But we went to the health department on the 18th of May and we said, can we have those forms? There are people who have internet connections and printers. Can we publish those forms, make them available online? Can people print them out at home? Um, that is still an ongoing debate within the health department. It still hasn't figured out whether that would be a, a good thing or a bad thing. My favorite example at the moment is today, this afternoon, the cabinet issued a statement, and in that statement, it linked to the list of active vaccine sites on the SA Corona SA Coronavirus website. This is the main, the official government website for official communication. A cabinet meeting has sent out this message to the citizenry of South Africa and said, "Here is the list of vaccination sites." That list, as of right now, I was checking it while we were talking, uh, lists 177 sites. We know from the Department of Health's own mouth that as of yesterday, there were 350 active sites. That list is enormously out of date. It is arguably useless, um, and that's the official communication. So in terms of communication and, and that part of it, the government is failing and, man, and, and it's failing manifestly. I don't think there's any excuse whatsoever for that. The EVDS system technically is more interesting and, and more nuanced than that. Uh, big parts of it is working really well. This is a massive database behind, standing behind a massive enterprise. Um, you know, coordinating all the bits and pieces of it is technically hard, um, and that is going reasonably well. Parts where it's falling down is not necessarily systemically problematic. So SMSs don't always go out when you use a mass SMS system. That happens. Uh, people get things late, they, things go wrong on their phone. Technology can be tricky that way. Um, uh, the uh, unexpected problems arise through things as simple as load shedding. You know, so suddenly sites have to go and fall back to uh, manual capture because ESCOM is not supplying electricity. Um, so it's it's a it's a big system spread across a big country in a very complex environment. Environment and, and a lot of things are going well and a lot of things are going poorly. But where there are glitches and issues and shortcomings in the system, the lack of communication and the lack of logistics capability to deal with that, to tell people that walk-ins are welcome. We beat our heads against a wall trying to figure out what was going in with walk-ins. Are they welcome? Are they not welcome? Will they be on the system? Will they be officially recognized? Um, it took us a very long time to figure that out. And even then, the answer that we got was, well, yes, you can, but you really shouldn't. Um, that's not going to work in the long run. That we have to fix. Kavil, turning my attention to you in terms of what we see, I mean, just looking at yesterday's uh, uh, numbers, I think it was a chart that Becky Caesar actually uh, put up, which showed, you know, the, the, the vaccinations per province um, and, and how many had been done per, uh, per day. Um, KwaZulu Natal seems to have encouraging numbers relative to other provinces. Um, what are you seeing on the ground in, in, in KwaZulu Natal? Thanks so much, Sheldon. You know, I think um, just to, to speak on Philip's point in terms of the walk ins, you know, we found that a lot of people on the ground in KZN have actually had a lot of success with walk ins. Um, they found a lot of delays in terms of the EVDS system. 
And I mean, when you go into a vaccination center, like Philip's just said, you know, you, you get to, to manually capture, there's so many different options. And the department's also said to a lot of people, well, to the public, that you can actually just walk in if you don't have the technological. This past week, um, the, the health minister, William Kiza, was in KZN, and he mentioned that uh, one of the concerns were rural areas, particularly in Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal, two very, very vast provinces. So one of the, the big uh, concerns was technology, but it appears that the walk-ins are working in KwaZulu-Natal. That being said, a couple of weeks ago, um, if you look at the St. Augustine's Hospital where the Sisonke study was, I think it was concluding the last couple of days of it on the Thursday and Friday, it was absolute chaos outside the hospital. Um, some people had received messages, but they were unsure of the communication. So, you know, I think communication as uh, on a whole hasn't been great, um, but people in KZN have really been benefiting from the sort of organization from the health department and many of the vaccination sites. Before I turn to some subscriber uh, comments and questions, uh, Mia, let me go to you around <laughs> uh, government communications. It's been in the spotlight a lot this week. You know, digital vibes and the, and the contract and the controversy surrounding the, 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 the minister. Um, that's not the focus of today, but just in general, Philip laid it out, Kafil laid it out, the communication around um, the, the, you know, the handling of, the, of coronavirus from the beginning. You know, and to the to the vaccine rollout. What's your experience been? So, Sheldon, I am. Um, if I had to name one of the biggest failures of this campaign, and I don't think everything is failing. I think a lot of good has been done as well. I would say it's communication. I think Philip made many good points around it. Now, the irony is that. You know, there are many things that the health department hasn't done that badly. They've implemented cold chain quite successfully at clinics. They've brought the vaccines finally into the country. They um, have managed to procure appropriate vaccines. Those are big things to get right. But the sad thing is that the communication around it is so bad that people would almost hold the government responsible for things that they didn't do badly as well. For instance, the J&J &J vaccines that have not been released, they have not been releasing consistent statements to remind people as to why we don't yet are we not yet able to release it? If you, for instance, look at the kind of information that they make available to journalists, this daily release that they sent, it's a different format. For the past three days, we one day we had provincial data, the next day we didn't. Um, how do you expect journalists, especially as you mentioned, that are not necessarily health journalists, to get all of this right all the time if this is the way in which you present this data? When you want to go through a formal channel to get data from the health department, Philip is right. You can wait for weeks for it. If you do not know someone's cell phone number and the person likes you or trusts you, you're not going to get EVDS information the afternoon that you want to get it. At the moment, what's happening is there's a wonderful person, Nicholas Crisp, in the health department, but he's about the only person that has information. You cannot have one person who has to deal with all the media in the country. So at the moment, if you don't get to him, you're not going to get the right data. And I think um, if we don't improve the sort of like um, communication, not just with basic information, but also reminding people, being transparent, why something is not happening. We're going to have huge trust issues. And Philip wrote a great article about comorbidities. You know, initially, the plan set, how are we going to prioritize people? We're going to go by age, and then we're going to go with by people who have comorbidities, and then we're going to go with the rest, you know, other people. And then that plan changed, and it changed officially, like about six weeks ago, the minister announced it. And I, we started reporting on the fact that comorbidities isn't a category maybe a month ago at Begisisa. But because the information was so scarce of the health department, I literally sometimes thought like, did we get it wrong? You know, is it perhaps like not the case because we're the only people saying this? 
if I start feeling like that and I deal with the health department all the time, can you imagine how bad the information is around it? The, the kind of question that we get from readers most commonly at Big Sister is when I have a heart disease, I have diabetes, when do I arrive? I can't understand why they're not putting out social media cards everywhere to say it's not how we're going to do it. And it's never, as, as Philip pointed out, going to be a category because it's simply not practical. Look at the consequence. The wrong people are going to put pressure on the health department or turn up at sites who are not yet eligible or are never going to be eligible. They're just going to be eligible by age. And it's, it's creating so much confusion. And I really, it's not hard to know the confusion because it's all over social media. I don't understand why they're not acting on it. That's true. Kavil, uh, just coming to you quickly, a couple of weeks ago, and I think this speaks to both Mia and Philip's point, a couple of weeks ago, we knew the rollout was happening, but it seems as if the last minute there was communication from the minister to his MECs on the Friday before the launch of the saying, listen, abandon what you're doing this weekend, because, you know, we need to think, we need to get this, get this up and running. And I think the point Mia makes is that Government has done a lot right, and I think we need to make that very clear, both Mia and Philip mentioning that. But Kavil, that was your experience, you know, a couple of weeks ago before phase two started. Yeah, that's right, Sheldon. You know, I think, um, like everyone said, uh, the government's obviously done a lot of good work. But in terms of the communication, just to lament on that just a little bit, you know, um, that communication from the minister went out to MECs the weekend before phase two began. And a lot of people that I spoke to in the ministerial advisory committee really were disappointed at that. You know, they felt that that communication should have been something that's very constant. It should have been something that was going out weeks before, you know, it, maybe even months. I mean, this is phase two. These are people over 60. We, we really have to work in communication. We've got rural areas. We've got people from different um, different parts of the country. Um, that being said as well, you know, a lot of people in the MAC were also complaining about the general communication to the public. We found that on level one, a lot of South Africans have dropped the ball. I, I think that's common knowledge. That's something that nobody can deny. And they felt that after the sort of India variant um, uh, chaos saga, whatever you'd like to call it, came up, there was so much of panic with the public, but there wasn't enough communication for people to understand, you know, the South African variant is a lot more harmful than, than the India one. And um, they just felt that there should have been more communication about the third wave. There should have been more communication in terms of just, we are being too relaxed as a country. And, you know, we've heard from so many contacts now that and sources within the MAC, a lot of senior people are saying that we are going to move up an adjusted level. And I think that's an inevitability because we find that there's so many mass gatherings, so many people just not wearing masks, not following the rules anymore. It's just something that, that has to happen. Again, communication most most definitely a failure. Thanks for that, Kavil. And we'll come to the, to the, I think there was a really interesting article that Mia, you and your team put out about eight lessons one of them being around, you know, being aware that, you know, not to turn vaccine sites into super spreaders, uh, but we'll come to that. I want to go to some of our, our reader comments and questions. Philip, I'm going to direct Chris's question at you, because I think you've done some of this work and, and could explain to Chris how he can, what to expect and how he can deal with this. Chris Reed says, I'm 71, I'm 70 years old. I registered for the vaccine within minutes of the site opening and have yet to receive the SMS to attend. When am I likely to hear? The reason we know this is thanks to Mia mentioned Nicholas Crisp. He's a deputy director general at the Department of Health now. And pretty much everything we know about the system comes from him. He has infinite patience and he's been talking us through all of these things. Basically, it depends on where you live. So what we what we now understand this and the system is uh, things were a bit shaky to begin with, uh, but it's now settled down quite nicely. So what should happen is if you are 60 and older, you can register. But that's simply a precondition. After that, it doesn't matter if you're 70 or 80 or 100. 
if you are registered on the system and the address that you provided falls within the catchment area of a vaccine center, then you are invited. So you will only, depending on where Chris lives, he might be far away from a place with a center and it might take a while for one to pop up and then he'll simply be waiting until that happens. Side note, you can change your address, we're told. Uh, we can't test this ourselves because we can't test on the live center, but we're told you can go in and, and change your address if you've moved house or whatever in the meanwhile perhaps move it to an urban area where you know centers are open if you can get the list of centers. Um, so then if you are within that catchment area, you are eligible for a vaccine at that uh, vaccine site. Um, and then it's an order of priority. So those who have registered first will be invited first. Um, and then it simply goes down the list from there on. There is no further prioritization. There's nothing else that happens. Your birthday doesn't come into it. Whether you have comorbidities is not even known to the system. You simply have to wait for that site to pop up. There are quite a few sites now. Um, so in, uh, in, in terms of distances at the moment, we're told that the uh, distances are set to 10 kilometers in urban areas. So if your address is within 10 kilometers, you are eligible. And in rural areas, it's either 20 or 30 kilometers. They seem to have settled down on 30 kilometers now uh, within reach of a center. If you know that center is open and it's close enough to you, then your turn should be coming. Thanks for that, Philip. I'll move on to another one around, you know, a question around process and, and systems, which obviously are important. And, and need to be there. Um, we've got a question here from Peter uh, Van Linden. He's saying, why doesn't government allow all ages to register for, for the vaccine and filter SMSs by age if required? Um, he says it's, it's uh, nonsensical to keep chasing subgroups. Um, Mia, Philip, you know, what, what would you say to, to that sort of reasoning um, or, or thinking? Well, I would say that there is very good science behind the strategy of our government um, to use age. So the reason we start with health workers and um, people who are older is because the first thing we want to do with vaccination is to alleviate the health system from being overwhelmed with sick people and prevent people from dying. If we start with everyone, we won't get to do that. So we have chosen the part of the population that's most likely to die. All the evidence shows us the older you are, that, that age is an even stronger predictor of whether you will fall ill or whether you will die than a comorbidity. So, and the other measure that we use is who is most likely to get infected and health workers around the world every country starts with them because they are most likely to get infected because they are exposed to patients so if we don't start with that group first we are just gonna vaccinate people left right and center while the hospitals are all filled up we need to have some order to first get the part of society that's gonna place them biggest burden on the health system and remove them. In the case of health workers, they're not necessarily all older, but we need people to look after the patients. And if we don't keep the health workers healthy, there won't be anyone to look after the sick patients. Once we've done that, there could be about uh, you know, less order. Um, but if we don't remove those sick people, if we don't prevent them from getting sick first, we, can you imagine, we're not going to have health workers to vaccinate people. We are I'm not going to have hospital beds for anyone else. And that's why we're starting with them. We can't just go and vaccinate everyone. If you look around the world, everyone, every single country has a phased in plan. No one just goes and vaccinates people. And in South Africa, I mean, yes, the EVDS has had glitches, but there was also a responsibility on the public to not try to cheat. So there's also a response. Can you imagine if we open it up with what's happening now, how wide that would be? How are you gonna control the people at the vaccination centers? Yes, I know Mr. Van Linden spoke just about registration and then, you know, we start to filter it through, but but it is not that easy. What I can say is that the registration for people of 40 and plus is going to open before we are finished with the 60 plus. So within the next two or three weeks, we're likely to see the registration opening up for that, not for going for vaccination, but for registration. So one, the, the processes will happen in parallel pretty much of each other, you know, while one group, group is still getting vaccinated, they'll start with registration for the rest. And if we don't get enough people above 60 registered, they will start with the people of 40 plus earlier. 
I just want to, I want to paint a scenario. You, you know, I see two things coming together. Teboho, you've been working, uh, as well as you, Kavil, have been working a lot on the third wave. Teboho, as we know, Gauteng, the free state and three provinces officially in a third wave. Mia, your team made the point in the eight lessons for vaccine sites. We know there are long queues for those sites not to be super spreaders. It may seem like, you know, basic, but it's, it's a really valid and important point. Going into the third wave, uh, Tebofo, what are some of the concerns that, 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 that government has, that health workers have? Because, you know, as we see that the vaccine program is, is, is only ramping up, you know, there are more numbers daily, which is a good thing. More people will want to get out as you open up to more groups, as Mia has alluded to now that is said to happen soon. You know, are we going to see people, you know, rushing off to these places in provinces and in areas where you've got, you know, rising, rising cases? Is it, is it, is it a toxic mix? Yeah, I think um, some of the experts that we've spoken to are very worried about uh, vaccination sites being super spreaders, especially in rural areas, where, as we said earlier, people are not registering on the EVDS system, but they're just showing up. So you have all of these groups of people who are high risk, who are then standing in long queues for uh, long hours in the day, and they might contract the disease from there. Uh, but another issue that we are seeing, another concern that we're getting from healthcare workers is that as the cases are rising in provinces, the nurses who are doing the vaccination are being moved from their workstations. So if the cases are rising and we have more patients in hospital, who's going to do the vaccination? You know, so um, I know the South African Medical Association was saying that the health department should have hired people, especially for vaccination, so that we still have um, staff that will take care of people who are sick. You know, um, and I mean, in Gauteng, for instance, we're also, there are also worries about, are we going to have enough hospital beds? You know, we have uh, the big hospital, Charlotte Matlake is closed because of the fire in May. Uh, it's unclear when the hospital is going to open. And the hospital caters for a large population of the province. So when cases are, cases in Gauteng are rising very, very um, very rapidly. Uh, I think in uh, the city of Joburg, yesterday we recorded 500 cases. So as the cases are rising, what's going to happen with bed capacity? Are we going to have enough beds? Are we going to reopen the field hospitals? Um, so, uh, I, I mean, as everyone has, has talked about this, communication around, around these things is not enough. We are not getting any answers from the department. So uh, we just have to just live on a prayer here. Now we've seen that uh, we, we, we've seen you know the likes of Diskem. So we've seen private sites uh, coming coming online as well. We've got one uh, comment here from Diane Nika saying very pleasant experience at Diskem. Four ways more, even without the voucher number, in and out within two hours. Very professional staff. Uh, I'm almost seventy. Thank you for very much for that comment, uh, Daya. What are we seeing? What's the impact of 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 spreading the load? As such, or spreading the reach, uh, you know, through the, you know, through private, private companies, private healthcare um, um, companies, hospitals, clinics, and the like. You know, we're getting extraordinary feedback from a lot of sites, um, and especially sometimes for walk-ins, not so much, but public sites, private sites, uh, clinics, specially constructed sites. People keep coming back to us and going. I got vaccinated. Yes, it took a couple of hours to sit in queue and get it done, but people were very pleasant. Um, it was it was a great experience in general. The level of care is great. Um, you know, people who have concerns about needing uh, to sign off and give consent are walked through that system. So the we must give credit where credit is due. The healthcare professionals on the ground almost universally seem to be doing a, a great job. Sometimes they get a bit short with the, with the people pushing their luck. And I think we can understand that too. Um, the, the private companies are coming to the table quite well. They've been frustrated themselves in terms of working with government sometimes, independent pharmacies complaining that they can't get turned on onto the EVDS um, and such like. Uh, but the, uh, I, I mean, the, the initial debate around the extent to which medical aids should help pay um, seems to have resolved quite well and everyone is happy with the outcome there. So the money is coming from the private side. Some of the resources are coming from the private side. Um, 
Now what remains to be seen is if this level of service can be kept up at both sides and whether we see a, a difference coming through. So the way the system is supposed to work is people on medical aid should be referred to a private site and people without insurance should be referred to a public site. But there is a top up element to that as well. So if there aren't enough people in the queue who are private, then, you know, you'll have public people being sent to private and, and vice versa. Um, and there is a concern, and I think it's a legitimate one, about whether both sides will be able to keep up the pace and, and keep up the, the kind of service or whether you will see, frankly, the South African system where the rich people get good service and the poor people get poor service. Uh, and then we've got an issue of relative inequality there that has absolutely not happened to date. I mean, we're, we're looking for trouble where there's no trouble yet. Um, so far on the ground, it seems to be going really, really well. Kavil, you've got a comment? Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll come to you soon. Kavil, you've got a comment? Um, yeah, thanks, Sheldon. Just, you know, Tavoka mentioned something about the hospital beds. And um, I thought it'd be important to share that quite a few people that uh, I chatted to in the Ministerial Advisory Committee indicated that it's so important in the next few weeks to get as many people over 60 vaccinated as possible. That's because in the previous wave, in the previous wave um, apparently 60% of hospital beds were occupied by people over 60 years old. So it's, it's so vital, you know, it, it could be the reason why um, a lot of these walk-in sites in the more rural areas, uh, I mean, a lot of the walk-ins in, in the more rural sort of vaccination sites have been so efficient is because perhaps government is starting to understand that hospital beds are one of the biggest concerns. Today, I even spoke to Professor um, Yunus Musa from um, the infectious, the head of infectious diseases at UKZN, and it was a big concern for him as well. You know, he, he said that um, while there, there is still a lot of research going on with COVID-19, we do know that vaccines help in terms of the severity of the, the virus and just keeping people out of hospital. That's one of the main factors. Mia, over to you. Um, thank you, Sheldon. Khalil made such great points now, um, particularly about the older people who will fill up beds. Um, but the interesting um, challenge that we're going to have during the third wave, and, and we're talking about hospital beds and like Gauteng being filled up in two weeks, right? That people are, who are getting infected now are going to be sick in two weeks. Um, it seems like the plan that actually there's been quite a bit of planning around when, how will we vaccinate during the third wave. And as Tabojo has mentioned, um, we will at the same time have sick people in, in beds and hospitals, so who will vaccinate? So the um, planning around it is that during the third wave, we will likely have fewer health-based sites for vaccinations because of that need to look after patients. And we will have more sites that are not based at health sites because the vaccinators at those sites are not people who have to look after patients in hospitals. They're just vaccinators. They're not like the nurses in the hospitals. Yeah. And um, But that presents an interesting challenge because a lot of the non-health sites are private sites. And as Philip has mentioned, the EVDS automatically assigns you the first choice if you don't have medical insurance is to assign you to a public site because it's easier with payments and that sort of thing. And mm. to assign you to a private site if you have medical aid. So during the third wave, if you're a public patient, those sites are mostly at health facilities. Um, it will be interesting to see what's going to happen to that, which is the largest part of our country, whether there's going to be more community centers um, where they, for instance, vaccinate, but then where are the vaccinators going to come from? They can't pull the nurses from the hospitals who need to look after the patients. So it might be that there's then more sort of sharing of resources, I would imagine, between private and public sites. Now, let me go to another, another question and comment. Uh, this is from Patrick Jolomba, who's joining the conversation over from the UK. Uh, we mentioned the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine um, earlier. Uh, Patrick's question and comment is, are, are, you, are you all very convinced that AstraZeneca uh, vaccine does not work against the South African variant or the variant identified in South Africa? Here in the UK, our data indicates clearly that if you are vaccinated with any of the current vaccines, 
you are to a very good extent protected against the so-called South African variant. Uh, despite the fact that we have the SA variant here in the UK, we are not seeing surges in cases with related to this uh, variant. And because we have almost 70% of the UK population vaccinated, surely that's simply a way to show that uh, uh, the AstraZeneca is somehow effective against this variant. I suppose Patrick's question in a nutshell is, should we have kept those AstraZeneca um, vaccines and, and not sent them back? Mia? No, we should definitely not have kept them. And the big difference between the UK and South Africa is the variant, the 501YV2 variant that is dominant in South Africa, 95% of cases are caused by that variant. That variant is not dominant in the UK. So you can't go by UK data and say, well, all our people are healthy and you also, we also sometimes have the variant from South Africa. It's not dominant there, it's only very few cases. So the data that we have shows us very, very clearly that the AstraZeneca vaccine doesn't work for mild to moderate cases. It, doesn't, it only provides 10% protection. When it comes to severe disease, we do not have data. It's likely that it could be working, but the reason we didn't go ahead and you know take the AstraZeneca vaccine none regardless is first of all because AstraZeneca is already working on a booster or a special vaccine an updated vaccine that is specifically targeted for variants that will work better against variants by the time that we have that results it will take us the the, the same amount of time to test with a the current vaccine works for severe cases as it will take for us to get the new vaccine. So it doesn't make any sense to go and test it. The second thing is that because we know that data shows us that variants, um, particularly the variant in South Africa, um, has an impact on how effective vaccines are. The variant in the UK doesn't really have an impact on how effective vaccines are. It just spreads faster. So because we know that variants affect that, it is better to take vaccines that have a higher efficacy. So for instance, against the original form of the virus, so that when that efficacy is reduced, the reduction happens from a higher level. So in the case of the Pfizer vaccine, it's about 95% effective. So if it's a little bit less effective here, maybe you look at, you know, like in the 80s somewhere, the AstraZeneca vaccine was in the 70s. So it's already less effective than the Pfizer vaccine. Um, um, that's really why we chose the J&J &J vaccine that's, that, has, that we have data for that shows us it's very effective against the variant when it comes to severe disease. Not that effective when it comes to mild to moderate disease, but still in the 60s, you know, far above the 50% level that the WHA says. And a small study in South Africa has shown us that Pfizer is 100% effective against our variant when it comes to symptomatic disease. So disease with symptoms, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's why if within that, and we have enough vaccines for everyone in our country at the moment, I mean, if they all arrive in time, um, why would we go and procure another vaccine um, if we have two with data that we already know works? Look, turning attention to you, the, the Business Insider team had a really interesting story, which got a lot of, uh, it piqued a lot of interest. Why were sports people getting the vaccine if we are in phase 1B, we're healthcare workers, and phase 2, 60, eight, people aged 60 and over? You know, I, I think this is going to be debated for a long, long time to come, and it's, and it's still relatively quiet. So we learned, and, and this, this wasn't a secret as such. Um, Mr. Mkise mentioned that in passing, when he talked about the last part of the j and Sasanke trial, he mentioned that some of the last uh, doses will be going to uh, studies around uh, pregnant women and people with HIV AIDS and elite athletes, and, and none of us made a lot of it at the time. And then we learned that what was happening this week was that uh, the Olympic team and sports stars, rugby stars were being injected with these J&J &J vaccines because they have to travel and they can't wait the more than 40 days for the second dose of Pfizer and so on and so forth and they won't make the Olympics so they're getting the J&J &J vaccine. Um, and this is of course controversial because this is a form of Q jumping perhaps. Um, 
Glenda Gray at the Medical Research Council says, look, we had these doses left over. We had about a thousand. We didn't really have anyone else to give them to. Um, it was a good use of them. And uh, they're also considering the extent to which that can be used to counter anti-vaccine sentiment. Uh, you know, you take a buff rugby player with a shirt off, getting the vaccine and smiling. That has a public relations impact, which might drive the entire effort further as well. Um, there are people on the, on the NGO side who are outraged at this prioritization and it's you know it's hard to argue against that but i i i think as a, as a political decision it may might have been slightly dubious as a technical decision you know logistically just getting it done it was a good decision in terms of national morale it might end up still being a good decision in the end but you can debate that all night long <laughs> unfortunately we don't have all night long i mean an hour has has, has really sped by uh, kavil uh, Teboho, quickly, uh, you know, in 30 seconds, each of you, you know, what is the focus now? I mean, we're obviously going into, you know, we, well, in three provinces, we're already in the third wave. There's talks of a lockdown. There's talks of the president addressing us soon. Uh, Kavil, let's start with you quickly. What What's your focus going to be? You know, it, it appears to just be sort of um, getting as many people of the 60 to vaccination sites as possible. Um, whether it's through the EVDS system or people just getting there um, and registering, you know, as walk-ins. Um, that would be the priority for the next couple of weeks, just in terms of, like I said before, just to reduce the amount of uh, elderly people that we would have in hospitals and just, just hospital beds in general, just to save that. That should be the main priority going forward over the next couple of weeks. Perfect. Uh, Teboho, on your side? Yes, um, I totally agree with Kavil. Uh, I think hospital uh, beds are going to be a very big thing, uh, but also the plans for the, the next phase of, of vaccination. Uh, is government starting those plans to start registering people who are under 60 who are going to who have to be vaccinated afterwards? Um, just planning around those things, but also just looking into uh, how the waves are going in the different provinces. Uh, the free states the Free State and the Northern Cape are going to be of interest for the next couple of weeks as well. But cases are also rising uh, in the Eastern Cape, which had a really terrible um, second phase. So it's going to be nice to just concentrate on that province as well to see what comes out of there. Right. Thanks for that, Tiboho. Thanks for that, Kavil. So the focus of this discussion was, is government watching the vaccine rollout system? Now, as a rollout program, now, as you've heard from Mia, as you've heard from Philip, as you've heard from Kavil, Tiboho, it's a lot of the times, yes, but also a lot of the times, no. You know, there are things that are, that are, that are, that are uh, being done well. You know, it's an unprecedented uh, uh, situation that we're all facing, and obviously government is leading the response to that. So I think we have to, you know, put that in context. Uh, could there have been better procurement? Could there be better uh, uh, communication? Yes, there is. But scientifically, historically, this is a very significant moment. And Mia, I want to end with you in terms of the significance of the Sisonke trial and what it means. I don't think we've, we've fully grasped what it is because the focus is on the vaccine rollout and getting enough people uh, vaccinated. But when we look back, how significant and what lessons have we learned from that trial that, you know, frankly, is going to, to, to you know, save lives? hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. So I think three interesting lessons that we've learned that we can apply to um, the national rollout is that um, booking is very, very important. And I think um, that's why we need to sort out the EVDS. Um, because as you mentioned, um, if you do, it, it's not just to get people to the sites. It's also if you don't book, then you can't um, prevent super spreader is um, events from happening because you will just have too many people at any time at a site. The other thing is the interesting thing that the Sasonki researchers found was that vaccine hesitancy largely disappears once you start to vaccinate people, when it becomes this thing that everyone wants the vaccine, um, there's not such a big problem with it. They didn't have much, they, they had hardly any problem with it. And that it works extremely well to um, take people who've already been vaccinated, to talk to people who are a little bit hesitant and 
in getting vaccinated. And then another interesting lesson, and that is something that our health department really must take on board, was communication. They had very, very clear communication to health workers as to the side effects. They were honest about side effects of vaccines. They were very clear as to where you can find them, where you can't find them. And they had lots of WhatsApp groups, you know, among the vaccinators and among themselves, and that seemed to work very, very well. The other thing that we actually didn't mention in our story, but I was at their discovery um, vaccination site today, and they took that lesson from Sasonki, was that when you prepare the vaccines, there needs to be a central point, and um, it doesn't help to have lots of little different places in a site to do that, and um, in a large site like Discovery, they have one point where pharmacists, you know, when you, when you do the vaccine, the nurse gets the vaccine in a syringe, it's not like they pull it out of the vial themselves, and that it helps to do it at a very central point, and obviously in batches, because the vaccine vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, once you take it out of a vial, it can only last for six hours in that um, syringe. And um, the planning around that needs to be really meticulous. And the Sasunki study has developed manuals for the J&J vaccine around that, that will be very, very useful for our rollout. My final question to you all, and we can, we can you know, a snap, snap, uh, my snap poll. So government has said it wants to vaccinate 40.4 million people by February uh, 2022 in that staggered roll, rollout phase. We've obviously started with people aged 60 and older. People like myself um, will have to wait until February 2020 uh, or 2022, rather, February 2022. I've got no complaints about that. I'll stay safe until then. But that's not the point. The point is, do you think government is going to meet its target of 40.4 million people by February 2022. Gavil, you're in my top corner. I'll start with you and go counterclockwise. Do you think government will meet their target? I think if every province starts vaccinating as the pace of KZN at the moment, we might have the chance of reaching that. Okay. Gavil punting his home province uh, there. Uh, Philip? No, unless a miracle occurs, but South Africa is the land of miracles. It wouldn't be the first one. We can hope. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, optimistically pessimistic. I think so. It's too, uh, how I des describe Philip's take. Mia? I think it will be tough to make that target. Um, I do think that a bit of good news about it is that after June, I think our pace will pick up significantly because there will be more vaccines available in the world. The reason is because America and Europe will no longer need so many vaccines because they would have you know, vaccinated most people. So it really does depend on how many vaccines we'll, we'll have and how many sites we can roll out. Um, I think it will be tough, tough to make the target. Tough to make the target, that's Mia's take there. Tebojo? Yeah, I think I agree with her. It's going to be very tough. Um, but if we get all the vaccines that um, Kiza has says uh, are promised, we might meet, uh, reach the target. But for now, I just think mm, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Kavil, Tebojo, Mia, Philip, thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. I think it's been thoroughly informative. Uh, we've really unpacked the question, which could sound somewhat simplistic. Is government botching the vaccine uh, rollout program? Well, you've heard it's not that easy as a simple yes or no. There's a lot that's gone into it, a lot that's, that, that is, it leaves us reason to be hopeful, a lot that has been done well, uh, but a lot of questions, a lot of criticisms as well around other parts of it, as you would expect uh, with a program this important and this uh, significant and this new as well. Having, having never vaccinated a population on the scale with a disease like COVID-19. I'm Sheldon Morais. Uh, we've been joined today by Kavil Singh and Teboho Monama, uh, senior journalist at News24, uh, Philip DeVette, associate editor at Business Insider, and Mia Milan, the editor of Becky Caesar Center for Health Journalism, um, doing some of the most important work in South Africa at the moment, telling uh, the story of COVID-19, vaccines, vaccinations as well. It really is the most significant health and science story, uh, I think, of the of at least the last 20, 30 years, if not 
longer. I'm Sheldon Morais. You've been tuning into uh, News 24's editor's table. Join us again. Stay with News 24 to find out what the next issue is that we will be unpacking with our journalists and specialists as well to help you understand and go behind the scenes uh, of, of the big topics everyone is talking about and uh, going beneath the surface. And thank you for you. Just to remember, if you'd like to uh, contribute to the conversation in future, just subscribe to News24. We will keep you updated with uh, the, the next editor's table and how you can get involved and have your questions answered by News24's team, as well as our specialists and experts. Uh, for this evening, it's a goodbye.